Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covard. As you've likely heard, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, died on Friday, September 18, 2020. Justice Ginsburg was a pioneer. She was the second woman to be appointed a justice to the Supreme Court, and she led the charge to ensure that women and others receive equal protection under the United States' laws. Okay, so right now there's a big debate going on about whether the president should appoint a new justice to fill Justice Ginsburg's seat before the election, and if he does appoint someone, whether the Senate should vote on the president's nomination before the election. As we watched this debate unfold, it occurred to my teammate Holly White that we've already created a short bonus episode about the Supreme Court and its function within the United States government. So we're offering you this special bonus episode again in case it might help you better understand some of the stakes involved in this present debate over whether to replace Justice Ginsburg now or after the election. Our guest in this special bonus episode is Mary Sarah Bilder, the Founders Professor of Law at Boston College. Mary offered her brief history of the Supreme Court as part of a larger four-episode series about the history, origins, and use of the Fourth Amendment. And with that, here's Mary Sarah Bilder with a brief history of the United States Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court is an entity that has come up several times in our conversation. And earlier you noted how in the 1830s, Chief Justice John Marshall said Americans couldn't use the rights in the Bill of Rights to sue the states, but that over time between the 1920s and 1960s, the Supreme Court gradually changed its ideas about our rights and how we could use the Bill of Rights in court. So the Supreme Court, would you tell us about the court and how a case makes its way to the Supreme Court? Yeah, so today the court has nine justices, and we see them a lot. They do a lot of public speaking. Sometimes they appear on Sesame Street. They give talks. A thing that people often don't know is that the only thing the Constitution tells us about the Supreme Court is that there should be one Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is the sort of most underdeveloped part of our government in the 1787 Constitution. It shows up in Article 3, which is the shortest article. And most of how we come to understand the court is itself a product of history. So a fact I love is the first Supreme Court, when Congress created the first Supreme Court, there were only six justices. There were an even number of justices. And nowadays we think, oh, you have to have an odd number of justices because we are used to thinking of the court as being divided 5-4. But that wasn't how Congress imagined the Supreme Court in the beginning. They imagined the Supreme Court as being an even number of justices. So a lot about the role of the Supreme Court has changed over time. In the beginning, the Supreme Court justices had to ride circuit. They rode on horseback down to South Carolina, for example, and Georgia to hear cases. Over time, the federal judiciary became large enough that the Supreme Court could do what it does today, which is it sits in Washington and just decides cases there. And in fact, the Supreme Court didn't even have their own building until the 20th century. Before the 20th century, the Supreme Court heard cases in Congress. Their quarters were basically in the Capitol. And when Chief Justice Taft became Chief Justice, he thought they should have a building. He had previously been president, so he was used to a world where there was the White House for the president and there was Congress had its own building, the Capitol, and he thought the court should have its own building. So Chief Justice Taft is the one who designs the building that we have today as the Supreme Court. So that makes the Supreme Court suddenly look like a real important third branch. But that's also just a product of our history. So a case can get to the Supreme Court by two different paths. The first path is it can come up through the federal court system. And the U.S. government has a set of 
federal courts that sit in a series of what we call circuits across the United States. And a case could come up through the federal district court to the federal circuit court and then to the Supreme Court. But alternatively, there's a second path. A case can be heard through a particular state's court system all the way up to that state Supreme Court. And then if the state Supreme Court decides an issue of what we call federal law, a question that relates to a federal statute or a treaty or the U.S. Constitution, a person can appeal or complain about that to the Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court also hears cases about federal and constitutional law that have been previously decided by the state Supreme Courts. And this is why then the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, becomes arguably supreme across both the federal court system and the state courts with respect to federal law. And what is the process of the Supreme Court? Once a case reaches the court, how does the court hear a case and what happens once the court renders a decision on the case? How are the decisions of the Supreme Court implemented? The court has many people asking to hear its cases. Something like, I think, 7,000 petitions are filed or writs of certiorari asking the court to hear its case. Nowadays, the court has a mostly discretionary docket. What that means is the court mostly can pick which cases it wants to hear. And out of the 7,000 or so cases that people ask the court to hear, the court hears a very, very small number. They listen to oral argument in approximately 80 cases. Last term, I think they heard 69 cases. So an incredibly small percentage of cases get heard at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court then asks people to write briefs, to give explanations in writing about which way the case should go. And then they hear oral argument. Lawyers argue in front of the court and the justices get to ask questions. And then they write an opinion. And that opinion then says to the lower court, the lower federal court, or the state Supreme Court, here's what the law is. Here's where you went wrong or you went right. And what's interesting about the system, the reason that they can be effective by only hearing, you know, 70 out of 7,000 cases, is that whatever rule they say the law is, that binds every other court. And binds is just a fancy word for saying everybody has to follow it. And so in essence, they can pick one case. And by deciding that one case, if there are a bunch of other similar cases, then every other judge is going to have to say, oh, well, the Supreme Court said this. Now that's the rule we're going to have to follow. Wow. That makes the Supreme Court's rulings really important because when it rules in one case, that ruling really impacts a lot of different cases. Is this the role that the Supreme Court is supposed to play in our legal system? Is that how it's supposed to interpret the Constitution and the Bill of Rights by hearing one case to rule on many cases? Well, what the Supreme Court does in interpreting the Bill of Rights and the Constitution is they make it relevant to our own time. If we were sitting as historians, we could just have a really interesting discussion about the Bill of Rights and where did it come from? And if we were maybe English professors, we could sit around and think about the language and the wording. But as lawyers, what the purpose of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution is, is to help us decide specific legal cases, basically to problem solve for the current world. And so what the court does is they read the Constitution, they look at the history of those words, they try and understand how the court itself has understood things. They try and understand how things have changed, both with respect to the Constitution's amendments and to the way we interpret the Constitution. And then they try and apply it to whatever particular problem they're facing today. And the court, therefore, is very important in keeping relevant a document that with words that were often written many, many years ago. In some ways, I always think it's almost like a little bit like clothing. We might still say we wear shirts and pants, but those have changed over time from the way we might wear them in the 1780s. If you'd like to hear more about the legal history of the United States, be sure to check out our full-length conversation with Mary Builder in episode 259. 
which you can find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 259. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.